Okay, good morning, everybody. Shalom. All right, shalom, shalom. It's great to see everyone start our week with a, uh, with a fire. I'm excited about this. Um, and uh, welcome to the new 11 o'clock slot uh, that we've been, we've been reshuffled into. And uh, okay, we spoke, we started last time we met, we started speaking about happiness. And happiness is a very important uh, trait that we're all looking for because there's no human being in the world who doesn't desire happiness, right? Even people who are sadistic or are, are uh, masochists are people who that's the way they derive their joy, their happiness. It's a little sad, but, uh, but we're all looking for happiness. We're all looking for a way to, to feel this joy. This And if you look at the entire world, and everything that we have going on around us, whether it's the iPhones, whether it's movies, whether it's uh, uh, hair products, everything is with the attempt to make your life happy and to make your life good. So how do we attain this? And one of the things we mentioned last time is that happiness is a state of mind. Happiness is not a destination. You don't arrive one day at happiness and say, oh, I've arrived. I'm at happiness, right? No, it's a frame of mind. It's It, it needs to be a way with which we live our lives, not a destination that we arrive to suddenly one day, oh, I'm at happiness. Another thing that we have to know about happiness is that happiness is not an external ingredient. It's an internal ingredient. Happiness isn't something that you, know, you can acquire with external means, not with money, not with actual objects, Happiness has to come within, and we're going to learn about how to, how to uh, attain that. So one of the important things that people many times mistake is that they think that happiness and laughter are the same thing, right? And one of the things we disclosed uh, la previously was that happiness, laughter, and comedy are very, very different things, right? Happiness... Uh, you know, even, even, you know, someone could be a little bit down. That doesn't mean they're not happy. They're very happy, but they're sad about something. Right? They can be a very happy person, but you can be, right? You can shed tears of joy, right? You get, you get an emotional about an e a specific experience. Your child graduated college, something special, a special event, and it brings tears. That, that's fine. That doesn't mean you're sad. Oh, don't be sad. No, no, it's fine. Right? You can be completely filled with happiness, notwithstanding you know, an emotion that you have. Right? Um, okay, so now, happiness can only come from internal observation and not external means. So an external object, you buy your new iPhone, that's not going to make you happy. Right? It's not going to make you happy. It might cover up some of your sadness, but it's not going to make you happy. Okay? Shopping doesn't satisfy or fulfill a person or bring about happiness. And someone else's decline is a very important thing. Many times people think, if that person wasn't in my way, I'd be happier. Right? Someone else's decline will never raise you up. Right? Standing on someone else's shoulders won't make you happy. It, 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 so you have... You have a competition. You op you have a coffee a coffee shop, and the guy opens up a coffee shop right next door to you, and you have this hatred. You have this disdain for this person. I can't believe he's someone would do such a thing, right? So you want to put him out of business. That's not going to make you happy. That's not going to help you. You know, it, it's interesting because just as a very side note, our sages tell us that don't speak to a person about his competitor. Don't speak to a person about his competitor because nothing positive will ever come from it. Right? No one has anything nice to say about their competitor. It's very rare that you'll find someone who'll say, you know what, go support my competitor. He's a, he's a nice guy. Right? He's, he's a good guy. It's very rare that you'll hear that. Right? It's like we have a better product. Right? We take care of our customers better. Right? And it's a good thing to have competition. Don't get me wrong. It's a good thing to have competition, not only I I for our economy and for uh, capitalism, but also the m most important time that competition is not only praised is when it comes, but, it, but warranted, 
is when it comes to Torah study or spirituality. So imagine here we have a synagogue here, a pretty successful big synagogue that we're, s we're, we're learning at right now. Imagine there was a new synagogue open up right next door. I'd say, hey, you know, it's, you can you can file a lawsuit for infringement. You can say, say well, you know, you can have all these all these. And you know what? In Jewish court, it'd be thrown out on its face. You know why? Because the Mishnah specifically tells you. It says that kinat sofrim tar the jealousy, the competition of study, only adds wisdom. So if you want to open up a school next door to another school, go for it. You know why? Because we're going to compete. And I'm going to want to have a better school than your school. And you know what's going to be the result of me having a better school? The children will benefit more. The students benefit more. So what happens is, is that when you do have that competition, the result is more Torah study more learning, better education. And that is always a better thing. Um, so someone else's decline won't raise you up. Trying to knock the other person off their feet will not elevate you, and you won't find any happiness from it. And then the last part of things that don't come from external is substance uh, abuse or drinking, things like that, when people take external things to try to fill their or cover their void, it doesn't help them. So, for example, someone has a, uh, someone sad, right? So I'm going to take a few shots now, and then I'll be happy. No, that's not going to do it, right? A few shots of alcohol is not going to change your happiness. Neither is any type of drug or any type of uh, uh, external substance that a person uses tries to, right, it may alleviate the pain that you have, but it's certainly not going to make you happy. Yes? Could you explain this to me? You know, by the way, I, I love when people ask questions because then I can drink yeah, my coffee. Yeah, so. I, have, I have a question. Mm -hmm. You're speaking to me from a question of um, Please rephrase your question. Yes, and we'll see it right away. What we, what we'll see in, in our prayers that we have exactly that as part of our key to happiness, okay? You'll see, you'll see that constantly, okay? Now, we, we mentioned last week that um, uh, the United States Declaration of Independence has that one of our rights is life, liberty, and their pursuit of happiness. So the pursuit of happiness seems to mean that you pursue it and one day you'll attain it, right? But that's against the principle we're talking about because you don't arrive one day at happiness, right? Happiness needs to be, it would, should start off, you have a right to be happy. Uh, right, but, 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 Happiness is not a pursuit. Happiness is the essence. Y either you are or you aren't. You don't pursue it. Okay, so I, I, I'm not I'm not telling them to change the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> but what I'm but but what I'm what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't be confused that one day we arrive at it because we That's don't. Right. I'm I'm just playing with the with the with the uh with the uh with the nuance. with the nuance exactly. It's not we it's happiness is not something you pursue. It's a state of mind. Exactly. Uh, sure. I don't have competitors. No, I don't. No. There you go. 
Happiness. Excellent. Thank you. He's not a competitor. I love him so much. I love him so much. And uh, I, I really don't, I, I, honestly, I honestly believe that I don't have co competition. And the reason I don't is because anybody who's teaching Torah, right, we're in the same game. We're on the same team. We really are. Yes. No, it's not the same, but it, can, it, 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 it makes it much easier to be happy when you're content with what you have. You're right. It's a tool. It's a tool. It means the moment a person feels, you know what, I don't need anything else in order for me to be happy. I don't need to go shopping, and I don't need to buy a new car, and I don't need a nicer house, and I don't need you know, uh, 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 more friends. And when we start looking at what we have and saying, you know what, what I have is exactly what I need. And I'm gifted by God to have exactly what I have. I'm like, wow, look, look, look what an amazing life I have. Exactly. So is it basically following the commandment of don't do any work? That's part of it. That's part of it. That, you know, it's a, it's a big wonder. It's a big wonder, okay? How, I mean, Ten Commandments. You're giving Ten Commandments to the Jewish people, which our sages tell us all 613 commandments that the Jewish people were commanded th with through the Torah are narrowed down to the Ten Commandments, and all the Ten Commandments down to the one first commandment, I am Hashem, your God, and all of the first commandment down to the first word, Anochi, I am, and then the first, all of the mitzvahs boil down to the first letter. And it's like... I mean, come on. I mean, and this is the commentaries. If you look at the Ten Commandments, we'll be there in a few weeks, right? And when we read Parshas Yisro, um, the portion of Yisro, we'll find that that's, if we read the Ten Commandments, and like, you imagine, like, this is what you're telling the people forever. This is the, this is the code you need for life. And what's one of those ten? Don't be jealous. I mean, come on. There's so many more important things than don't be jealous. But that's exactly why it's there in the Ten Commandments tell you if you want ha true happiness which the Torah is the manual for happiness the Torah is the manual for how to be a happy human being and guess what if you're starting to look out and you're not looking in you're going to miss the boat and that's why it's in the Ten Commandments to tell you don't be busy looking out You'll be, you're busy looking outward you're not looking in you're going to miss it Right, and that's the key I don't know if I told you, my, you know, my parents, we, we had a neighbor who walked over to us once and he says to us, uh, you know, I think it's time to paint the outside of your house. So my father said, you know, you're the one who looks at the outside of the house, right? And if you want it changed, you're welcome to paint it, right? <laughs> right? We look outside of our house, we look inside our house and we love it. Everything is, it's, it's beautiful, you know, it's like, so... I think it's more of a principle. The principal idea is that one shouldn't be busy looking outside. We're looking inside. We're looking at our, own, at our own lives. Look at what we do have. Look at what we're gifted with. So it is said about one who is sad that God's presence, as the Talmud says, that, one's, that God's presence cannot reside among them. Someone who's sad, the presence of God, we all want to have God's assistance in our life. It, it, it's a contradiction to have God in the same area, same uh, uh, vicinity as someone who is sad. Yes? So it's all, at first says it's a perspective. We have to understand that it's perspective. Um, I'll tell you a story. I had a guy who called me up. I don't know if I mentioned the story. If I did, please excuse me. Um, I literally taught 25 classes last week, and I have no idea what I said in each one of them. So, <laughs> so recently I said the story. I don't know where. So if I said it here, please excuse me. Um, it's funny because I had a, a day and a half that I was supposed to be a little bit on, like on vacation because the rabbis were out of town. And the be day before that vacation was supposed to kick in, I was supposed to get all these little projects done, all these little things that I had. And I, I mentioned this on Thursday, right? And I had one phone call after another of people calling me and saying, oh, I need you to cover this class for me. I need to cover that class for me. I need you to cover this class. It ended up, I had no day, no vacation. It was great. I taught classes all day, but no break. So, uh, you know, and classes that weren't my natural classes, the ones that I have, like, sitting with all of you here on Sunday mornings. So, either way, so 
the middle of a story. Which story? Uh, right, right. So an individual calls me up, right? He's been working for his company for 28 years. And he's calling me. He's, he's a grown adult, right? He's turning 60 shortly. And uh, he calls me and he's crying bitter, bitter tears. He's like, Rabbi, you can't believe it. It's the worst day of my life. He says, this is the company. I, I bleed this company's ID. And he says, I love this company. I love everything about it. And my manager, my direct report, who is the person in charge of the whole Houston area, all, you, know, you got to work under him if you're in Houston. He says, he's, he's, uh, he's attacking me because of my faith and attacking me because of this and because of that. And he's always asking me, um, I pr telling me I pray for you and I this and I that. Oh, okay. He says, well, I don't know what to do. I said, uh, it's very simple. Talk to God, right? Thank you, Hashem, right? Thank Hashem for everything you have and talk to him. See, he says, well, what, what can he do? What can he do? I said, look, I want you to give me a list of everything you want and how you want this resolved. And he tells me, I want to work. I want to continue to work for this company. I don't want a settlement. I don't want to, you know, an employment because it became a whole employment lawsuit, which he won. And, uh, and it was it was it was a bit, it became a big case. I, I referred him to an attorney, but I said I want to know what you want. He says I want to stay with this company. I want to continue doing my job. I love what I do, but I don't want to work for this evil person, this evil direct report. So I said, so ask God. You told you told me what you want. Just talk to God. So he says I, I I'm, I'm not sure that he can help, but because the rules are the rules, and it's you know all these things. I said try him. Try him. Fine. Turns out, less than three months later, there was a lawsuit, and he won. He was offered $20 million as a settlement, but he would have to leave the company. And he said, no, I don't want the $20 million. I want to stay with the company, and I want to work for the Dallas office. And they said, fine, we'll let you work for the Dallas. Everything he requested, he got. Every single thing he requested, he got. So here. And, I, and I've asked him numerous times. I said, tell me, what did you think when you were crying to me on the phone? He said, I thought it was all over. Right? I said, and what do you have now? He says, I have my dream job. He says, I sit in my own office, which is three minutes from my house. I work for the greatest company in the world, a company that I love. And I don't have to work for this evil person that was harassing me every day for 28 years. He says, and I, and I get to work with my clients. I get to continue to do the job I love to do. I, 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 you understand? That here's the perspective I think was wrong, where he thought the world was ending, and it wasn't ending. It, God was making it a situation that would be unbearable so that he gets into the best situation he could dream of. And that's usually the case. If you ask people who lost their job, you ask people who were, uh, you know, had a, a challenge come their way, most of the times it's to open up a new doorway that opens up a whole new world. So that we also have to have perspective on. <laughs> we also have to have perspec perspective on, 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 on death, right? Does death mean that we're, it life is over? No, it doesn't, not in Jewish faith, right? We don't live here for here. We live here as an investment for our world to come. So every mitzvah that we do, every act of kindness that we do, every word of Torah study that we learn is only an investment that we're putting into our account in the world to come. So essentially, when someone leaves this world, yes, it's sad because we as human beings feel a, a loss and we don't have that, that opportunity to, to, you know, to share a beer with that friend, right? But, or a coffee or a tea or whatever it is that, that you want to share with that friend or a good story or a joke or so many good times that we had. But if we think of the, uh, you know, let me ask you a different question. So Lily, if I ask you, what are you? What are you? What are you? You're right on all of them. I say, what are you? You, you. 
right? Those are associations to things and accomplishments, great accomplishments. But what are you? The correct answer should be, right, I'm a soul. That's really what we are. We're a soul, and we have this cloth above our soul called a body. Now, on top of our body, we have also clothes, which is why, by the way, when someone, when someone's family member passes away, we tear the cloth, right? We tear, we tear our clothes. If it's a parent, it's over the heart. If it's not, it's over the, okay? Why do we tear cloth? Because what we're saying, essentially, is that the body is what's gone. The soul is still there. But the body is clothes for the soul. So just like the body is the only thing that, that is gone, but the soul is not, the soul lives on, so too we s- we're showing it on ourselves that the body is torn. The clothes are torn. It's not the actual person. It's not the actual essence of who they are. So essentially, if we're thinking about it, yeah, it's sad. It is sad that someone passes away. But it's sad for us. It's not sad for them. They're in a much better place. You know this. They took it from us. <laughs> yes. Then how do you, um, what is your interpretation of that needless? What's, what's needless? A child um, having passed. Mm-hmm. So... I'm I'm going to I'm going to tread cautiously, okay? Because we have to understand that there's a lot of emotion involved when there's a child, a helpless child. And I know this, uh, you know, we had a a a, a, a fam- we have a family as part of our organization that lost a child, a 5-year-old child. Right? Suffered for years uh struggling with 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 brain cancer. So I- this was very close to home and this is something that we we, you know, as a as a family, as a torch family, uh, really, really struggled. Every day I'd go, I'd go uh, pick up breakfast and go to the hospital and, and sit with, uh, with the rabbi and be with, the, be with, the, with his son. So it, it, it's very challenging. What do you mean? What did this kid do wrong? He did nothing wrong. That's true. But our sages tell us that the only people who suffer at a young age are people who their soul was so perfect. They needed one small adjustment. I'll tell you a story to, to, to really make this, bring this home. There was a great sage, a great Hasidic master. This is totally not on a topic, but it'll help us understand. There was a great Hasidic master who wakes up early one morning. It's a snowy morning in, in you know, Eastern Europe. And he wakes up his students. He says, quickly, quickly, I, nee- I need you. I need you to come with me. And he gets uh, eight other students and himself, and he g- puts them on the wagon. He tells the wagon driver, let's go, let's go, we got to go. And he goes to, the, to, the, to like the last house at the end of the town, Right, it's really far from where he was. He goes all the way to the last house, and he tells the wagon driver, "Stop, stop right here." They all get out. It's early in the morning, and he knocks on the door of the Rebbe, and uh, he sees a man there at the door. Opens up. He says, "Is the baby ready? Is the baby here?" "Yeah, the baby's here." And the students are like, what, "What's going on here?" Like they had no idea what was going on. And the Rebbe says, "Quickly, quickly, let's 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 have the bris." And like, how did he, the Rebbe even know that today's the eighth day? It's not like there's a news report or you get a, excuse me, you get a text message from the synagogue saying congratulations to the uh, the Goldstein family on the birth of a baby. Well, how did the Rebbe even know this? And he they he quickly they they do the bris, and they have a quick meal that you do after the bris. And as they're about to walk out, the husband says, "One second, he hears a cry from the other room. The mother's crying." And the the husband goes to the other room, and he comes back and he says, "The baby died." And the Rebbe goes, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. And now the students are completely confused. They have no idea what's going on over here. What, what, what's this what's the celebration? What's going on? So the Rebbe tells the students, he says, listen. He says, last night I had a dream. And the great sage, the Rashash, now the Rashash is one of the great commentators on the Talmud. He passed away on the later commentators on the Talmud. And he was, he was a very, very wealthy man. He helped pay for the for the uh, publication of the Talmud, the mass publication of the Talmud. And his commentary was printed actually I- on each page of the Talmud, right? Now you're talking about a serious commentator, a semi- serious scholar. And he had died just a few days earlier. And when he was at the heavenly courts, they said, you know what, you're, you're perfect except for one blemish that you have. One blemish that your soul had, and that is that you didn't have a bris on the eighth day. 
And he, this, this is the Rashash himself talking to this great Rebbe, this great master, and he says to him, this baby in this house is me. It's my soul that's coming back to have the bris on the eighth day. Please go early in the morning. Give me my bris so that I can get my place in heaven. That's the one little correction I need t- for the perfection of my soul. He says, I'm begging you, get a minion out there. Give me that bris that I need so that I can have my perfection in the world to come. And so the Rebbe was happy that as soon as the bris was over and they finished the meal, now the baby's soul can be restored to its proper place. So he's saying, Mazel tov, Mazel tov, not that the baby died, God forbid, but that the soul was now restored to its proper place. We have to understand the whole idea of life. Why are we really here? Why are we here? Every person, and this is why the study of Musa is so important, is because we're here for a very specific purpose of accomplishing and perfecting our soul's job, everyone's task. Um, There was a quote that was sent to me today. Give me a quick second. It was sent to me in one of my chats that I was on this morning. And it w- said it was really a, a, a profound statement. It says that everybody, give me a second here, was it? Here we go. Life is the most difficult exam. Most people fail because they're trying to copy others, not recognize that everyone has a different test. Right? Every single human being on planet Earth has a different test. And the thing is we're saying, oh, Looks like this guy's got a good life, and he's got his Rolls Royce. Why can't I have a Rolls Royce? And we're trying to copy other people, right? But we have a different test. Everyone has a unique test. We have to know our own character. We have to know our own, our own uh, qualities, our own flaws, and everyone has a different setup. That's why traits in Hebrew are called midot. Midot, a midah is a measurement. It's also the same word for measurement. Midot is plural for midah. Now, I- what does that have to do with character traits? Why would you use the word measurement for character traits? So imagine this. Imagine you walk into a, into a science lab. Now, a science lab, you look and you see. I, I remember when I used to walk in, in high school, you used to see, like, you have all of these uh, tubes, and they have different colors of different, uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, chemicals, a yellow and a purple and an orange and a green and a blue, and you like... You know, what, what's, what, what are all these things? So imagine that, that lab, and all of those different chemicals and the different measurements is every single one of us. And every single one of us has a different measurement. This one has a little bit more of anger. This one has a little bit more of patience. This one has a little bit less of jealousy. This one has a little bit less of, you know, that's the way each and every one of us, there are no two human beings who are exactly the same. It says, Kishem shonim shonem kachdeo sem shonim. Just as our faces are different, our opinions are different, our challenges are different, our construct is different. Everything about us is different. Sure. I saw a quote. I'm going to look it up. I'm sitting in the Nominations. There you go. There you go. Beautiful. Thank you. Right? That's right. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. I love it. I love it. Um, that's, go, that's good. Right. It is said about one who is sad that God's presence cannot reside among him, uh, amongst them, or amongst people who are sad. It says, Ein shechina shura ele simcha. The only ingredient that God and God's presence can handle is happiness and joy. It's an amazing thing. You know, it's funny because I grew up in a religious home, and I learned in a yeshiva for many, many years, and I didn't understand this till later. And once I understood this, I said, this is the reason, this is the calling that I have, and I need to share this with every single Jew. So this is why I'm sharing it with you today, okay? And that is, Judaism has one obsession. Happiness. That's the obsession of Judaism. Everything about Judaism is, is bringing about happiness to people. Everything. Right? And if you look at every mitzvah and you try to understand the mitzvah to its full depth, whether it's the mitzvah of Shabbos, whether it's the mitzvah of, of tzitzit, whether it's the, 
it's it's understanding what true happiness is. And the more you understand a mitzvah, take any single mitzvah and do the research on it and look through the commentaries on it and, and write an essay on it, do a thesis on a mitzvah, you will find that it is the key to absolute happiness. Each one. And you put all of them together, we should be dancing on the rooftops every morning. We're like, you know... You know, it's funny, in, in, in my shul that I daven in now regularly, I'm a member at five different I, I don't have a synagogue, so let me just put it out there, okay? I don't have a synagogue of my own. I'm not a rabbi of a synagogue. I just, I'm a rabbi, I'm ordained, but I only teach Torah. That's it. I don't want to get into the membership, and you get ritual committees, and membership committees, and, and, and I, I don't, I, I don't yeah, dues committee. I don't get into any of that. I'm here to teach Torah, and that's it, okay? That's so I pay membership to five different synagogues, and I just, I, right, right? So I, anyone that's in walking distance to my house, and then I have a couple that during the weekdays um, I'll go to as well. There's a new synagogue that opened up in my neighborhood, and this is a synagogue like I've never been to before because people are simply happy, right? You come in, and there's singing, and there's dancing, and there's good food, and it's just it's just a great joy to be in the synagogue. It really is. It's a it's such a it's such an a, a an exciting place to be in. It really is an exciting place. There's so much energy. And I don't remember what my point was now, but I was trying to get to something. Happiness. But happiness. But oh, so, so re, re, everything about Judaism, and that's and that's the thing. How many synagogues have I been to, where everything's about new, new. Shh. Right, and people are shushing each other, and people are just like, and it's like, uh, hello, just be happy, come on, right? Have some joy, have some, have some excitement. And the problem is that many, many times, I was telling you that when I, when I grew up, I didn't understand this. I don't know if it was explained to me, and because of my ADD, I didn't hear it. Right? It's possible that I just didn't hear it, but I didn't understand that it's all about happiness. And once I understood it. I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. I mean, there isn't a single mitzvah. And you can think, oh, it's so restrictive. I can't understand. Why would the Torah be, you know, the laws of kosher, so restrictive. The laws of Shabbos, I can't do this, I can't do that. That's one way to look at it. The wrong way to look at it. But you can look at it at every single mitzvah being an opportunity for happiness. And if that's the perspective you'll have, you will be the most excited, joyous, celebrative human being on earth. Right? You will have every single minute of your life with happiness. Right? And that's, that's essentially what God wants us to be. To the point where God says, if someone is not happy, my presence can't reside in their midst. I can't. God can't be there. So why would God give us commandments that would make us unhappy if his presence can't even reside there? Okay, yes. Yes, God, God hears every word, but sometimes God is saying, you're going to the wrong door. It's locked for a reason. Go to the other door. And sometimes we don't want to because it, it's forcing us to leave our comfort zone. And God sometimes says, sorry, if road is closed permanently, go the other way. And we're, we're, like, we're, we're challenged with that because I'm not comfortable going there because that's not what I'm used to doing. And God sometimes says, you know what? Get used to it. Right? You're, this is the only way that you're going to be successful. You're going to try to push and push and push. It's not going to work. Take a new path. Right? And that's sometimes something we feel uncomfortable with because it's, we're not in control. You know, we love to be in control of everything. And we're not always, like you said about the story of your daughter's wedding. Right? You had everything worked out and then Katrina came. And God had a different plan. <laughs> and it was so much better and you're so thankful for it. Right? At the time, you thought it was that the world is caving in. Right? And then, guess what? You have your grandchildren three minutes from your house now because of that. God knows what he's doing, right? Sometimes he has to bring a whole Katrina on the whole New Orleans so that you can have your grandchildren next to you, right? Now say like, wow, wow, God did all that for me, right? That's what you should say, right? Yes.
And uh, just to get too close to that, in Judaism, too close, in my opinion, and I've been on this, you know, what I take is the health of my children, my grandchildren, close ones of mine, the personal achievement, it's just up to me to, to as you say, get outside of your comfort zone. But how is this, that perspective, it seems to me in the in, in the Christian perspective, which the people saw in others, was that who prayed for success? Who prayed, uh, prayed for material things? I've never really thought of, about it in that context. So I, I, you're the third person to ask me that question this week. Isn't it too small for God? God has got more, more important things to worry about than my child's high school test and that his softball game and my marketing uh, a pitch for, for the company up in, in Dallas, right? No. God really wants to hear about it. Right? And we've given numerous examples, but think of it like this. right? Does a father want to hear his child's issues, whatever they are? But, but don't, don't you have more important things to worry about? Right? You have bills to pay. You, uh, you know what? You can tell your kid, you know what? I really don't want to hear about your complaints. I don't want to hear about your, your quarrels with your friends in school. I just, I'm not interested. I have too many things to go, going on, right? What type of father would, would say that? Right? God is our father. We say in our prayers, Avinu av harachaman. Our father, our merciful father. We say it every single day in our prayers. God wants to hear. In fact, the most important part of prayer our sages tell us in the Talmud is our personal supplications that we add from our heart. And that includes, you know what? God, I have a splinter here. Can you help me? Help me solve this little... And that splinter can be a, a real physical one or it can be a metaphoric one. I have an issue I'm dealing with. Please help me with this. Right? Um, it could be something you're trying to make a sales pitch. God, help me with this. Bring me success, right? That, because all of Judaism is about relationship. You know, it's an amazing thing, and I, I want to, I it might be worthwhile if we're already on this topic to bring this out. All right, we've said this before, but it's worth repeating. In the Haggadah, every single year at the Pesach Seder, we sing a song called Dayenu. And in that song of Dayenu, we say, we, we, we sing the same song again, die, die, yeah, no, right? And it's like, okay, what is it basically? We're saying each one of the praises of all of the stages of God's kindness. God took us out of Egypt, but even if he didn't take us, split the sea for us, thank you. If God split the sea but didn't bring us to the other side safely, right, still thank you. And if God didn't, you know, bring us through the desert for 40 years and, and give us food, die, yeah, no, it would have been enough, right? Each one of those thanks. But one of them doesn't make sense, particularly doesn't make sense, and that is if God brought us to Mount Sinai but didn't give us the Torah, Dayen would be enough. It's like the equivalent, the example I give always, is like taking your child to the ice cream store and not getting him ice cream, right? It's like Dayenu, it's enough. We went to the ice cream store, but we didn't, we didn't actually buy ice cream. Or I took you to the, to the, uh, to the Toyota Center, but we're not going to actually go in. Like, why would you do that? Why would you bring the Jewish people to Mount Sinai and not give them the Torah? Our sages tell us because the purpose of going to Mount Sinai was not to receive the Torah. The purpose of going to Mount Sinai was to have a revelation of God to the Jewish people where the relationship will be built. It's you think of a couple, okay? They get engaged, right? And the girl runs around saying, I'm the luckiest person in the world because I have a ring, right? Because I got a ring. I got an engagement ring. Look, 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 look. I got an engagement ring. Is that the most important part of this whole experience? I sure hope not. <laughs> right? I sure hope it's about the relationship that's been developed here and that's concretized or memorialized through the ring. The Jewish people going to Mount Sinai was about a relationship. Here the Jewish people are getting married, so to speak, with God. But you know what the, the ketubah is? You know what the... the reminder of that experience you, you ever go on vacation so have you ever gone on vacation yeah, my wife tells me. she tells you where you're going on vacation and then you go right <laughs> great you're a lucky man right so <laughs> so so what where was the last vacation you went to uh, seattle. seattle did you buy a souvenir okay so then give me a vacation a different place italy you went to italy no, I don't like it. okay you don't like italy <laughs> Israel, here we go. Did you buy a souvenir? Uh, 
something that says Jerusalem. Yeah, why? As a momentum. What's the purpose of that momentum? What's the purpose of that momentum? There you go. So when you go back home and you're 8,000 miles away and you see that candlesticks and it says Jerusalem, you're like, oh, you remember that time? You remember, you remember that experience? You remember where we went? We went to the Shuk and we went here and we went there. We went to the Western Wall. And it was like, you remember, all of that experience comes back. The Jewish people are sitting on Mount Sinai. They have the greatest revelation of the history of the world. It says there will never be a revelation like that. Again, the Jewish people say, that's it? You're just letting us go like that? Now, just stay in the desert for another 40 years. Yeah, just like, no, give us something. We need to take something with us. Right? Give us something that we... God says, you know what? I'm going to give you forever a memoriam that you can forever remember that relationship. And it's 613 souvenirs. The 613 commandments that we have are 613 souvenirs. Every time you walk into your house and you kiss that mezuzah, you know what it has the potential if we have the right ideas and we understand the purpose of the mitzvah? Every time you touch that mezuzah and you give it a kiss, without the kiss even. I remember I had a rabbi in yeshiva. He would put his hand on the mezuzah and he'd stop. And then he'd walk into the room. Every time he'd bring himself to the... I stood at Mount Sinai and this is the gift that God gave me, that mezuzah that I have on my door is the reminder that God took us out of Egypt. He built a relationship with us in the desert and this is the reminder every time I walk into the house I remember God is loves me he's he's my father in heaven he's waiting to hear from me I actually had a mezuzah I remember when I when I used to work in the building of the Braze Oaks Towers so we had a mezuzah outside our office so uh, an African-American woman was working opposite our office and she says to me, she says, I, every time I leave my office, I see that, that thing on the, on the doorpost. What is it? I said, oh, it's a Jewish security system. <laughs> 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 so she says, how can I get one? <laughs> so <laughs> You had to be at Mount Sinai. <laughs> right. So, no, so it's, it, it was really, it, it's, but, but that's, the idea is that God says, I'm there to protect your, your houses. I'm there to show you. I'm always around. I'm always around. Right? So I can look at a mezuzah and say, oh, this is another way the rabbis are going to gouge me here. They're going to get me here for another 40 bucks on a mezuzah, right? Uh, there we go. Like, yeah, we know the rabbis are rolling in dough, right? We know that, right? right so th no, that's not the idea. The idea is that someone's got to work hard to write the scroll properly. And I would uh, recommend, by the way, that if you have a mezuzah, get it checked. Because I've had people bring me mezuzahs and it was just, they bought it in some gift shop in Tel Aviv and turns out it was a piece of paper it wasn't even it wasn't even a mezuzah right so you got the mezuzah case doesn't mean anything you can have a mezuzah without the case it's the parchment inside that has the portions from the torah that's the most important part of a mezuzah but that's just one mitzvah we have so many mitzvahs that each one is an opportunity to bring us back to that revelation to that reminder so like you have that jerusalem you know uh souvenir you can have a, a magnet. You know, you look at the magnet, you're like, oh, you remember we went to the Grand Canyon? And you remember we went to Yellowstone National Park? And you bring back all of the memories that, guess what? Every single mitzvah in the Torah has the ability to bring back that recollection of Mount Sinai and that relationship. And that is the purpose of them. We think we went to Mount Sinai to get the Torah. Wrong. We went to Mount Sinai. That's why Judaism is not a religion. Judaism is a relationship. It's all about the relationship. And the more the relationship is, is real, the more we ask and, and we should ask for all of our personal things. God's got plenty of time for you. He loves you. He cares about you. He wants to hear every single little detail, every worry, every concern. Right? That's what prayer is for. Many people think. I had a guy after one of my classes on Saturday uh, he says, to, I said, so I encourage everyone, let's go, let's go join the congregation. He says to me, Rabbi, prayer is not for me. I said, why not? He says, I'm, I'm done with prayer. I said, come, come, have a seat. I want to hear this. Okay, so he sits down. He says to me, you know, for years I've been coming to synagogue every Saturday. And all I do all day, the whole time I'm in synagogue, is run after the chazan. 
I have no idea where he's holding on page after page. I'm going back and forth. Oh, the Chazan turned the page. I'm going to the next page. I'm trying to follow with the, right? He says, I have no idea what's going on. He says, I'm so frustrated. By the time prayer is over, I'm out of breath and I'm tired. I said, well, that's not prayer. He said, what do you mean that's not prayer? Of course that's prayer. I said, no. I said, prayer, you could be sitting in your car at the stop sign, at the red light, and talk to God. You're waiting online at the bank. Talk to God. You're, 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 at, you're at the library. Talk to God. You're sitting in front of your computer. Talk to God. Now, there's a reason why we pray in a synagogue, and that is because you know, if I'm trying to convince you to do something for me, right? so if I come myself, you can say, nah, no, I don't think so. But if I come 10 people to ask you, right, you're like, okay. Okay, I, 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 I'm convinced. Okay, I got it. Right? That's why we have a quorum. That's why we have a minion. So we come, it's very persuasive. We all come together as a, right? And that's why we have the concept of a minion. It says, bur- Absolutely. And in fact, he's told me, this was about seven, eight years ago, he said prayer has been revolutionized from that conversation. He says, I love praying now because I talk to God all the time, everywhere. I thought... It's only with the minion, in the shul, with the chazan, following, in, you know, and, and the problem is like this. There's another thing. We just learned this in the Talmud in the Dafyomi last week, is that the prayers, you need to understand them. You need to, so if you don't understand it and you're reading it in Hebrew or singing the songs along with the congregation, but you don't understand the words, what's the value? You have to understand what you're saying. So if you can read it in the English, read it in the English. Understand it because prayer is not just an exercise of how committed you are. Prayer is an exercise in conversation with God. Now, there's a reason why we say all of the uh, the requests and all of the uh, uh, all of. In fact, imagine this: the way prayer starts is first we praise God. First, we do we praise God. The second part is after we praise God and we establish His kingship and that He is capable of all. Then we ask our requests, and then at the end we thank. Right, so imagine you call, go to your uncle. You're like, you know, uncle, I, I see you have the uh, the Porsches out there, and it's like you really never used, right? Can can I just borrow it? Right? I don't know if the uncle would say yes, but you, if you start the conversation like this, you say, you know, you know, you're the greatest uncle in the world, right? <laughs> I think you have a better chance, right? <laughs> right? Now, God doesn't need persuasion, but that's the proper way to to request. And the first thing we do is God, right? God can do anything. God, you're the master of everything. Every bird sings your praise. Every, right, every animal sings your praise. Right? You're, you're, hakol yachol, you're capable of everything. Look at the amazing miracles you've done for the Jewish people. We talk about the exodus from Egypt in our prayers. Az Yashir Moshe, the song that the Jewish people sang at the, at, at the, at the, at the, uh, where, they, where the sea split. And then we start saying, Yishtabach Shimcha, your name should be praised. And we talk about all the God brings the light and he brings the darkness. And we talk about all of the Yotzer Or, all of the creations of God. And then we talk about the great love God has for us. And then we talk about, then we say the Shema. And then we, and then we go into the Amidah. And the Amidah, we're praising God. Hakel, Hagadol, Hagibor, Vanura, all of the amazing praises of God. How awesome he is. And then what's the next thing? Mechaye metim, God resurrects the dead. He's able, to, he's able to do anything in the world. And he's able to heal the, the sick. And God is able to release those who are, who are imprisoned. And all of the amazing praises of God. Mechaye metim. And then ha'el kadosh, God is holy. And then we start asking our own pra- uh, requests, our own private requests. We ask for wisdom. We ask for repentance. We ask, and it's an interesting thing, why do we ask for repentance? What are we asking? Our job is to repent, not for God to help us, right? Because the idea is of repentance is that we, in order to repent, we don't have the ability. Come on, really? We made such huge mistakes in our lives. So we're going to, right? How can we get out of it? All we have to do is desire to get out of it. Now we have to desire to get out of it, right? So there's a great great, uh, story that's told about one of the you know, one of the great sages that his student came to him and said, he says, Rabbi, and he comes and he starts crying. He says, he says, I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel Rosh Hashanah. You start then, the, the, I don't feel Yom Kippur. I don't feel a trepidation. I don't, I, I don't feel anything. 
He says, I want to feel something. And he's crying to the Rebbe. He says, I want to feel something. I want to feel, you know, spiritual. I want to feel elevated. I, you know, I, I feel nothing. He says, that's the feeling you should have, right? If you care that much about it, that you cry about it, right? That's, that's the real feeling you should have, right? The idea is sometimes we need to, we need to desire to make change. Are we able to make the change ourselves? No. Many times we can't. How can we, you know, sometimes we make a mistake and we're like, I don't care, this is my opinion and I'm sticking with it, right? No, I'm not going to change it, right? I'm right. Even if you prove to me I'm wrong, I'm still right. <laughs> and we see that that's possible today. Just look at politics, right? On every side of the aisle, right? You do something wrong, I don't care. This is my opinion and I'm sticking with it, right? It's, 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 it really is, it's, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, experiment of, of, of human psychology of right, how people get so stuck in their ways. So how can we actually repent? We need God to help us. But we have to have the desire. First base. How do we get the first base? We want to repent. And each one of the, the prayers, we ask for healing. We ask for success, by the way, in our livelihood. Right? Bless our year and all of our fruits and all of our vegetation and all everything. Our sages tell us we need to ask for our own personal requests. There's no such thing as like, eh, God is too busy for me. He doesn't, he doesn't care about my son's little league game. Oh, yes, he does. And he cares about, and I have, I have an amazing story. When I was in eighth grade, I remember there was a rabbi who visited my yeshiva. And uh, he said exactly this idea, that there's no such things you can't ask for any request. There's nothing that's too small. Ask for anything that you want. God is waiting to hear your prayers. God is waiting to hear your prayers. So right after that lecture, we had the mincha services. And after mincha, every day, at the afternoon services, we'd go to secular studies. We'd have three hours of secular studies. And suddenly I remembered that my teacher told me the day before that if I don't bring in my homework, I'm out. I'm kid- he's kicking me out. So... Um, I, and I suddenly, I'm, I'm, I'm there praying mincha, and the rabbi just said, you can ask for anything. So I said, Hashem, please, I don't want to be thrown out, okay? But figure out something with this teacher because I don't have my homework, okay? So figure out something. But please, I need your help. I know you think I'm joking, but of the entire year, that was the only day that the teacher forgot to ask for homework assignments. <laughs> All right? Tell me God doesn't answer our little prayers. Mm-hmm. And um, so I buy a lot of equipment. Yeah. And then there's probably a little bit of money in the background. But I don't, you know, I, I have a conversation with God at that point. <laughs> and really, it's a it's metaphorical in nature and mm-hmm. every word kind of brings me down to, to thinking about a grateful life. So then it concentrates and I kind of, you know, I plan the lottery and that don't go well and all that, but I have a little bit of extra money now. Mm-hmm. And um, so God comes back and says, hey, you won the lottery so many times. I couldn't possibly be a winner. <laughs> and then I walk out and I go, that's my job to say, you get wrong. My wife yells at me about buying lottery tickets, <laughs> which I never look at, but I'm a happy camper. There we go. So I'll tell you, are there any billionaires in the room here? <laughs> <laughs> any billionaires? So I, 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 I beg to differ, and I hope that I ask the question again in three more minutes and everyone raises their hand, okay? So I, I left my checkbook in the car, but um, I'll go get my checkbook after class. Is there anybody here who's willing for a nice round $50 million, okay? I'll write you a check right after class, okay, for me to just chop off your right hand. Right hand, you'll never have a right hand again, right? You'll still have a left hand. And if you're a lefty, I'll cut the left hand, and you'll have the right hand left, okay? Um, right hand, right? So anybody here ready for $50 million? Going once? Anybody? Thinking about it, huh? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to up the ante because I don't have any takers here. How about for $500 million? That's a half a billion dollars. A half a billion dollars. That's your lottery ticket right there. I'll take off one leg, both arms. Okay, one, one leg, both arms. Anybody for a half a billion dollars? And this is real cash, okay? Half a billion dollars. That's $500 million. You'll take it, really? Can you get the saw? It's in the back of my car, okay? Yeah? I can buy new looms. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. But he's not serious, right? Right, exactly. 
Right? Anybody here, okay? I got, I'm going to up it for a billion, okay? But I'm, I'm done here, okay? A billion, okay? Really, I'm serious, okay? I'll pop out one eye. One eye. Just one eye. You'll have the other eye for good, okay? It's good. Um, you will pop out one eye. Take off those two arms and leg. Anybody for a billion dollars? Okay, let me ask the question again. Any billionaires in the room? Absolutely. I offered you a billion dollars to get rid of your limbs, and you're not ready to give, give them up. You're not ready. You know, there's actually a story told by Rab. You know what? It's worth more to have your limbs than to have a billion dollars. Okay? Be yeah. <laughs> Speaking for myself. <laughs> so there's actually a story that's told. Rabbi Noah Weinberg says this. He says, imagine you're standing on the seventh floor of the Empire State Building and gazing at the cityscape. Suddenly, a rather large man pushes past you and ed gets to the window, opens the window, and announces his intention to jump. You, what do you yell? Stop, stop, stop. Don't jump. Don't do it. Right? So this fi six foot five figure turns around and says, try to stop me. I'll take you with me. I'll take you with me. So what do you say? Uh, uh, okay, no problem. Sorry, have a safe trip. Any last words? Anything you want to say? He says, um, let me tell you my troubles. He says, my wife left me. My kids won't talk to me. And I lost my job and my pet turtle died. He says, so I have nothing to live for. So the individual has suddenly has a flash of inspiration. He says, sir, close your eyes. He says, for a minute, and imagine that you are blind. No colors, no sights, or children playing. No fields of flowers, no sunsets, nothing. Now imagine that suddenly there's a miracle. And after your blindness, you open your eyes, and your vision is restored. Are you going to jump? Or are you going to stick around for a few weeks and enjoy some sights? He says, I guess I'll stay for a week. I'll stick around for a week. But what happened to all your troubles? I thought your troubles are so terrible you have to jump, right? He says, well, your eyesight is worth at least $5 million, right? So you're a rich man, right? If you really appreciate your eyesight, the other pains are insignificant. Now, we have, okay, but if you take it all for granted, then nothing in life will even truly give you joy, okay? So if you take things for granted, you take your... The ability that we have to walk, the ability that we have to talk, the ability that we have to, to hear music, the ability that we have to see beautiful things, right? If we don't, you know, the ability we have to, to eat delicious foods, to digest. You know, I was, I was at a conference a, in, uh, last year in March, and I remember this is... I, this was one of those over-the-top con Jewish conferences. You know, they, they, they serve you food till you're, like, over, you know, overboard. And, and I'm there. We're all before Shabbos. It was a whole weekend, a whole Shabbos. And there's every delicacy you can imagine. Every delicacy you can imagine. And we are um, we're eating. And then I see that they, this guy comes into the, into, the, into the lobby. And he comes in with a wheelchair. And he has all of these pipes attached to him. He's got an oxygen tank behind him. And then right behind his wheelchair, a guy carries in an entire crate of oxygen tanks so they should have enough oxygen for Shabbos. Now I'm thinking to myself, here I am stuffing my face like I haven't seen food in a thousand years, okay? And this guy, if he doesn't have those oxygen tanks, will be dead. You understand? This guy is grateful to have oxygen to breathe in, and here I am, right? Y you understand the contrast, right? Do I have to carry all of those canisters of oxygen? No. And do I have a right to be upset about life? Do I have a right to be sad? This guy, every hour, has to change an oxygen tank. And he has to have someone feed him through a tube. Where's our gratitude for life? That ought to make us happy. My rabbi said to me, he says, if you're ever depressed, go to a hospital. Go visit some sick people, and you'll be very happy that you have life. Right? So w we haven't gotten even, like, past first base in our class here. But <laughs> we're going to get more next week, hopefully. But um, uh, God's presence cannot reside among those who are sad. 
So my friends, have a wonderful week. Go be happy. Go enjoy life. And please, if you haven't signed in, please sign in. Please leave us your email so we can share with you about any scheduling changes if there are. Have a wonderful week, everybody. And looking forward to seeing you next week.